Today, we are in week two of a sermon series called Past Perfect. And before you fall asleep with that idea, let me hasten to say this is a theological lecture, not a grammar, uh, a grammar teaching, a grammatical teaching, okay? Uh, and I need to explain past perfect before we get completely lost in second grade English. The idea we're looking at in this sermon series is that in the Old Testament, promises are revealed through types and shadows and symbols, and those same promises in the New Testament are fulfilled through Christ. So what we do, we find types and shadows revealing something that in the future would be fulfilled. Christ is the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament promises. Last week, Pastor Joey talked about the idea of the lamb and that you see the lamb being sacrificed all throughout the Old Testament rituals uh, to cover sins. So the, the idea of forgiveness of sins is revealed, but the fulfillment of that in the New Testament is through Christ as the perfect sacrificial lamb. Okay, so this week we're talking about the idea of a high priest. Now, I get to teach today one of my all-time lifelong favorite Bible verses. Now, I know some of you who know me are skeptical because I say that about every verse I ever preach. But I promise you, this is one of my top 10,000 most favorite Bible <laughs> verses. I love them all. But no, seriously, this is like one of my two or three most favorite Bible verses. This is actually the first passage of Scripture I ever memorized as a brand new Christian at 16 years old. Now, I memorized it in the New American Standard Version, so my words are going to be jumbled probably reading the ESV today. It'll be difficult. So we're going to look at uh, my favorite passage, but also we're going to look at what, oddly enough, has become a very controversial idea in theology today. Uh, and it's really strange that, and, and, the, and the idea is this, the exclusivity of Christ, the idea that Christ is the only way to God, and there is no other. Every other approach to God is, quite honestly and quite frankly, it is wrong. I know that sounds narrow, but Jesus did say that narrow is the way, all right? And so no apologies, although that has become controversial, even in Christian circles, where people want to broaden the way to God, and we're going to look at a passage that narrows it, okay? And here we go, Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest, and pause for a moment, that's the concept we're looking at today from the Old Testament, the great high priest and how that's fulfilled in Christ. Here we go, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 16. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews but we know who read it. They were Hebrews, okay? Um, they were Jewish people, Hebrew Jewish people uh, 2,000 years ago. And being Hebrew Jewish people, they understood exactly what was meant by this phrase, high priest. We don't have high priest today. And so what happens in a, we're not, a, we're not very few people in this room today are Jewish Hebrew people. Uh, most people here are Filipinos who have some type of Catholic or some type of Christian background. And so what we need to do is erase what we think of when we think of a priest, and we need to go back into what Scripture says about a priest. And let's look at the Old Testament concept of priest, again, which made sense to the Hebrew people, but sometimes it's a little distorted for us because the word doesn't mean the same thing. So when we think about this Old Testament idea of a priest, you need to know, first of all, there were three classes of religious leaders in the Old Testament. There were prophets. Okay, prophets were usually not full-time ministers. They had other jobs, but a prophet's job was to speak from God to humans. 
It was the voice coming from heaven to earth. It was God speaking through a human voice, through the voice of the prophet to people. Okay, so God to people. The second class, not that they were first, second, and third, but the second uh, group of religious leaders were called wise men. Okay, not wise guys, but wise men. And the wise men, again, they were speaking from God, usually to government leaders, usually speaking to the king and giving counsel, that type of thing. Sometimes they were deeply involved in spiritual education as well. But again, it's speaking from God to people. So prophets and wise men were God's representatives communicating to people because people couldn't hear directly from God. The third group are what we call priests, and that's what this text is about. Priest. Now, when the priest started, it was, remember, Moses thought he wasn't a very good speaker. He probably really was, but he acted like he wasn't. And so Aaron, his brother, came along, and he started the priesthood. There were mentions in Scripture of other priests, but they weren't Hebrew priests. They weren't Jewish priests. There was Melchizedek and other priests, and, and even, even Moses, and Moses' uh, father-in-law and others. But when it starts what we know of as the Old Testament priesthood, it starts right there with Aaron, and then his sons, and then generation after generation. Eventually, this priesthood grew so long they needed organization so there was appointed a high priest and that was sort of the guy in charge the administrative uh, executive director of all the priests but a prophet would speak from God to man a priest would speak from man to God because humans didn't have direct access to God they went through a prophet to hear from God and through a priest to get to God if I could summarize, when we read this text in Hebrews, and says Jesus is our great high priest, so there's a picture of a high priest in the Old Testament. If I can take one word to describe what that high priest did, the word is mediator or mediation. And a mediator is one who stands between two warring parties or two parties that are in disagreement or two parties that, who have had a relational breakdown. Sometimes you hear about mediation that happens maybe in the business world. Sometimes it's in legal situations and, and two parties don't see eye to eye. They don't want to go through the, uh, through the time consuming and money consuming court cases so they agree on a mediator. Uh, you may see it a lot of times in sports, especially in American sports, uh, the NBA the NFL, the hockey league, the base professional, it seems like every couple of years, one of those professional sports leagues is bringing in a mediator to make a decision about labor uh, and, and, and ownership between ownership and players and the players union and all that. And a mediator comes. Instead of taking the time to work through the court systems and the mediator comes. Now, anytime a mediator gets involved, anytime, there are two things you're recognizing. Number one, to bring a mediator in means I've got a relational problem. If everything's okay, you don't need a mediator. The fact that we bring a mediator in means we don't agree. We have a problem. We have a breakdown. We have a great gulf, a great chasm that we cannot bridge. Second thing that we're admitting when we bring a mediator in is that I can't fix it by myself. There's a problem and I can't fix it. Therefore, we bring a mediator. Now, the idea of the Old Testament priest was that mediator. He stood between people and God because people have a problem. We have a relational breakdown with God. Because of our sins, we are separated from God. It's not a physical separation. It's not because heaven's up there, like Stevie Wonder said, 10 billion light years away and we're here. That's not it. It's not physical. It's not an intellectual separation, although God is a lot smarter than all of us. It's not that we don't have the knowledge. It's not physical. It's not intellectual. Our separation between man and God is a moral separation. God is holy. We are not. That's the separation. If it were physical, then we think we could go to a temple or a church or whatever, and then we're close to God and we leave and we're not. That's not the way it works. I know sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking we're closer to God when we go inside of a building, but it's not a physical issue. It's a moral separation. And so we need a mediator. We need someone to stand between. We need some, a prophet to speak from God to us. We have the scriptures. That's a lot of where that came from. And we need a priest to go to God. That's how it was. But the scripture tells us Jesus became that. Now let's look at what the implications of Jesus becoming that mediator. You know, today modern mediators, at least between man and God, 
We have some inadequate mediators. We have some substitute mediators. For instance, many of us have grown up trying to get to God through the saints. Now, the saints were typically very righteous, godly people, many times did miracles, and, and were great examples of what it means to walk with God throughout history. But they would tell you if the saints could walk here today, they would say, no, you cannot get to God through me. I can't help your prayers get answered. There is a mediator, and it's not a saint. Others of us would go through a priest, a physical human priest right here on earth, to think that we could get to God through a priest. Others, as wonderful as the Virgin Mary is presented in Scripture and all of the great things, but there's one thing that is never we find about her in Scripture, and that is she is not a mediator between humans and God. Actually, what she said when someone tried to go through her, she looked at Jesus and said, do whatever he says. She never said, come through me to get to the Father. You do whatever he says. She got out of the way, not as a mediator, not in any way as a go-between between between people and the Father. She was never that. She was a lot of honorable, wonderful things. But you know, when we get into the evangelical world, we say, oh, we we don't go through the saints. We don't go through the Virgin Mary. We don't go through the priest. What we do is go to the pastor. And the moment we think that we need to get Pastor Joey or Pastor Christian or Pastor Emil or, or, or Pastor Jonathan or one of the pastors to pray for us, then we are making them a false mediator between us and God. Let me give you something that's going to shock some of you. God will not answer Pastor Joey's prayers any faster than he will answer yours. He has no access to God that you don't have. Okay? Some of you don't believe that. You're still going to try. <laughs> you know, others of us use our parents as our mediators. Uh, some of us use our spouse. Now, most of us, our spouse is more godly and closer to God, and maybe he does answer their prayers more often. But they're not our mediators. Some people use their victory group leader. That's how they get to God is through the victory group leader. You know what a lot of us... Hey, and great job up here, worship team. Okay, great. Some of us use this guy. Stand up, stand up. Okay. He is not a mediator to get you to God. The worship leader is not the one that gets us to God. Okay, what does the scripture say? What does the New Testament say about this idea of Jesus being the priest? About how we get to God? Why we need a mediator? There's a conflict. There's a relational breakdown. We have a problem. We need help. Here's what it says. 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one God... And there is one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. One God and one mediator. That is extremely exclusive and narrow. If you need to get connected to God, there is only one mediation available. There are not multiple ways. There are not other ways. There are not alternative ways to get to God. There is one. Jesus said essentially the same thing in John 14. Verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, let me say that again, no one comes to the Father except through me. Wow, that's exclusive. You know, people get upset about that and they go, that's just not fair. It's not fair that Christians say that Jesus is the only way. Well, Jesus said he was the only way. He was either right or wrong. We have to deal with that. He said, I am the only way to get to the Father. There is no other way. No one gets there except through me. No one gets to God. No one gets to eternity. No one gets to heaven. No one has a relationship with the Father except through Jesus. That's what he said. Now, he was either right or wrong. There's not a third option. If he was wrong, then he was delusional. If he was wrong, then he was crazy. If he was wrong, then he was a liar. But if he was right, then there is no other way. Last week, we took a friend from Singapore. God bless Singapore. Today is their 50th anniversary as a nation. We took a friend from Singapore last week uh, who had been to the Philippines many times, but my wife and I took her to uh, Tagaytay for dinner. Now, 
we sincerely desire to take her to Tagaytay tai to see the sunset and to eat some wonderful food. Imagine if we had gotten on Edsa, going north, through Quezon City, Bulacan, Mexico. That's next, right? <laughs> okay, we go through Pampanga. Now we're in Baguio. It doesn't matter how sincerely we want to go to Tagaytay, we will end up in Tagigarao. <laughs> Sincerity does not affect truth. If I am sincerely on the wrong road, I am still on the wrong road. But here's what happens in our, in our modern sort of illogical religious world today. Okay, well, they believe this, but they're so sincere. And it seems rather unfair for God to only provide one way to himself. Let me think about it a different way, because I don't think that's unfair at all. Here's what's unfair, is that because of my sins... Our Father in Heaven sacrificed His only Son so we could get to Him. That's what's unfair. And how dare I get to God and say, I think you should have made other options. What He did was mercifully and graciously and sacrificially and lovingly and at great cost provided a way for rebellious, sinful, selfish mankind to get back to him. And how dare we say you should have provided other mechanisms. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody has an eternity with the Father apart from me. All sincerity respected, but put it aside because that's not the issue. Now, there's no room for any other options. Now, because, and let me get to the point of this text. Because Jesus is our high priest, because Jesus, presented here in Hebrews chapter 4, because Jesus is our mediator, our high priest, the one who is the bridge to the Father, how do we respond? The Christian life is all about understanding who Jesus is, what he did for us, then responding accordingly. That's what Christianity is. Understand who God is. Understand what he did for us. Now respond to that in a way that's honorable. Christianity is not doing things and building a life that somehow is supposed to please God and then God responds by saving us. Or God responds to our righteousness by answering our prayers. Or God responds to us being really, really good people by being nice to us cosmically and giving us a good parking place. That's not how it works. The way this thing works is we get to know who he is and what he did for us, and then it changes our lives and we respond. Now, how do we respond? The scripture tells us Jesus is this great high priest, this great mediator, this great one who, who connects us to God. So how do we respond? Verse 14, since we have a great high priest, to the end of the verse, let us hold fast. To our confession. Hold fast. Christianity is a confessional faith. It's not a faith that's primarily about doing good things to get God to like us. It's about confessing what we believe, speaking the truth, believing in our hearts, speaking with our mouths. And so what he says is, because of who Jesus is, hold fast your confession. Keep speaking what you believe. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how confusing it gets, no matter how painful and no matter how persecution and whatever might be happening around you, hold fast to your confession. Do not stop speaking what you believe. Speak the truth. What does it look like to hold fast? September 3rd, 1987, the headlines in the L.A. Times newspaper said this, quote, Pilot sucked out of plane, hangs tight until landing. Hangs tight. What does it look like to hold fast or hang tight? Here's what happened there. Small commuter airlines, Eastern Express, the pilot was, the pilot was Henry Dempsey, and they had this tiny little plane 
in Maine, near Portland, Maine, and they took off and they heard this rumbling in the back. So Dempsey turns the plane over to his co-pilot. He goes to the back and the door where they put the luggage in this small plane is ajar. And so he tries to fix the door and it flies open and he's sucked out of the plane and he holds on to that door as the plane is flying. They make an emergency landing and when they land... Here's what the official at the airport said, quote, I would like to think it would be impossible to hold on at that speed. It would take iron nerves and strong muscles. And then this official used this phrase, the phrase pride off. Here's what he said. He said, when we got to the plane, this man was holding on and we had to pry off his fingers. He couldn't let go. He was alive, but he had held on. He had held fast. He had such a grip on that. I don't know how, I mean, the plane is flying and landing, and he's like a flag flying behind. <laughs> and when they landed, he couldn't get his hands off. That's what it means to hold fast to the confession of your faith, no matter what is going on. You know, people are trying to pull your faith out of your hands. And the world around us tries to pull our morals and our integrity and everything we believe and stand, there's someone trying to pry our hands off. But what are we supposed to do? Because Jesus is our go-between. We hold fast to that confession of faith. What do we do also? Secondly, we hold tight. We hold fast. Also, verse 16 says, because Jesus is our high priest, therefore, verse 16, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. With confidence draw near to the throne of grace. A lot of people are content to live at a far distance from God. But what our passage here says, because Jesus is our high priest, because of who he is, because of what he did for us, we can draw near to God. We can get close to God. We can live right there near him. What is the confidence? A lot of people don't have confidence approaching God. A lot of people feel insecure approaching God. That's why they go through Pastor Joey. That's why they go get someone else to pray for them because they don't have confidence. Listen, Jesus is a much better mediator than Pastor Joey. Pastor Joey's amazing, but Jesus is the mediator. Your victory group leader is amazing, but Jesus is the mediator. So we need to confidently go to him. Not have confidence in ourselves. This picture is my friend Brandon. Uh, Brandon, in the off-season, when the NBA's not in season, he lives in Nashville and attends our Every Nation Church in Nashville. A few years ago, a group of us from church drove to Memphis to watch Brandon play basketball. There were about 36 of us. And when we got to the FedEx Arena uh, at the end of Bill Street where all the best blues music in the world is played, we go in there and at the, at the, uh, at the uh, will call box, our tickets are waiting for us, and there's also stickers that he told us to make sure we put these stickers on our shirts. Okay? So it's 36 of us, the game's over, and the sticker means when the, when, the, when the basketball game's over, the players go, the locker room's in change, and they come out, and there's a roped-off section right down under the basket where big security guards with weapons are standing. And there's all these fans trying to get down to the players as they're coming out. But when you have the sticker... You go right past the security guards with guns and you smile at them and you go right in there. And if you try to go in there without a sticker, uh, you don't get very far. Not a good idea. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. It doesn't matter if you're the biggest fan in the whole world. Hey, I know him. I'm a fan. No. The question is, does he know you? And so we got down there, and what happens is they give these stickers to family and friends. And so, you know, the players had, like, this guy, maybe his cousin or somebody he went to school with is there. So everybody's got one or two, and then there were 36 of us walking in there, friends and family. What does it mean to draw near with confidence? If you have the sticker, you can confidently go. But what is the sticker? It's not an NBA sticker. It's the blood of Jesus. It's having him as your advocate, as your mediator, as your 
high priest. You can go through there and go, hey, I'm a member of Victory. Let me in. They're going to go, what? No, where's the sticker? Um, let me show you what, sometimes it's intimidating going into God's presence. I want to show you a picture of what it means to confidently draw near. This is an iconic photo that you've probably all seen. It's the, it's the Oval Office in the White House. Now, I would be intimidated. If I ever went in the Oval Office in the White House, I would probably say something stupid. Okay, I have something like, oh, God, I can't believe it. It would be an intimidating thing. But here you have this little kid, JFK Jr., crawling around on the floor in his father's office, who's the president of the United States. He feels totally comfortable rolling around and playing under the desk. I hope none of us would do that if we went in there. He has access. Something far more intimidating. Put the next one. Another equally intimidating concept. <laughs> Imagine this. This is, this is Joseph Bonifacio just walking in and taking over his dad's office. Now, how many of you would do that? Just walk into Joey's office like you owned it? Probably not. And then there's Joey's son and then his grandson acting like he owns the office also. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. When you have Jesus as your high priest, you can walk right into your father's presence. <laughs> as if you're supposed to be there. Like you're at home, like you're a relative, like you're a friend, like you're a son or a daughter. That's what he wants you to do. But not if you're going in saying, Pastor Christian prayed for me and said I could come. No, no, no. Only way you get in is through Jesus. We're back at the second half of verse 16. He says, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might find, receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That we might receive mercy and find grace. When you get in God's presence, you know what you get? Mercy and grace. A lot of us don't want to get near God because we're afraid he'll zap us with a lightning bolt. We're afraid he's mad or we're afraid he's going to judge us. Look, he doesn't have to get you close in order to judge you. If he's going to do it, he's going to do it while you're running anyway. <laughs> That's a foolish reason not to go close. But if Jesus is our high priest, our mediator, the one who bridges the gap, then we can come boldly, confidently. And what do we find when we get there? Surprise, mercy, and grace. Now, what is mercy and what is grace? Let me explain mercy this way. Mercy is when we do not get what we deserve. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. If that's not confusing enough, let me explain it this way. We'll get real theological here with these, with these biblical concepts. Okay, imagine you are driving your car and you go straight through a red light. Anybody ever done that? Can anybody confess your sins today? You've <laughs> driven through a red light today, this morning. How many did that on the way here? Obey the laws of the land, okay? <laughs> now, you run through the red light, okay? I think I may have done that one time in my life <laughs> this week. <laughs> um, you go through that red light. Now, let's say there is a, uh, a, a very honorable police officer doing his job and stops you. What do you deserve? A ticket, right? You deserve a ticket. But if he has mercy on you, mercy means you do not get what you deserve. You broke the law, you deserve to pay the penalty, but mercy says, I'll let you off. How many thank God for mercy? Yes. I'm not talking about bribery, I'm talking about mercy. <laughs> that's a different sermon. Okay, that's mercy. You don't get what you deserve. Because of my sins, I deserve to be separate from God, and I deserve to go into a Christless eternity. That's what I deserve. But I find God's mercy, and I don't get what I deserve. But what is grace? Grace is a little different theologically. Grace means I run the red light, 
I'm pulled over. This kind, gracious policeman says, I'm having mercy on you. I will not give you a ticket. And the next thing I know, he's washing my car. <laughs> and he's filled up my tank. And he's changed my battery. And he's put new wheels on. Ah. Mercy, grace means I get what I don't deserve. Not only do I get let off, but I get piles of blessing. So you know what happened in my life? I was separated from God because of my sin. But the mercy of God forgave, let me off the hook. I don't get the judgment I deserve. But beyond that now, that's enough. Listen, just the mercy of God that I don't have to have an eternity apart from me. The mercy of God is enough forever. But you know what he does on top of that? He pours grace out on me. You know what that means? He gave me an amazing wife. He gave me three wonderful sons. He gave me two daughter-in-laws and counting. He gave me a beautiful granddaughter. He gave me a wonderful job getting to be a pastor at Victory. He gave me all this grace he poured, all this stuff that I don't deserve. How can we not serve him every day of our lives? How can we not give up everything for him? When we go into his presence, what do we find? We find mercy and we find grace. We don't get what we deserve. That's judgment. Then we get what we don't deserve, which is all the blessings he gives us. Now, we're out of time. Christian, come up and close us in a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads right where we are? Would you bow your heads? Lord, we want to stop for just a moment and say thank you. Thank you for being a great high priest and a great mediator so we could find you and find mercy and grace whenever we need it. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why do we give God a hand for that? Thank you, Lord. God, Lord, we thank you that we can lift up our hands to you because of Jesus Christ. And not just that, but every single day we can go to your presence boldly, confidently, because of the finished work of Christ so that we can have mercy and grace in our time of need. And so, Father, we thank you. We praise you today. Bless your name, God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise your name.